I'm Eric Marcus, and this is Making Gay History. Cute. Cute. <laughs> Deborah Fowler is a veteran, former classroom teacher, U.S. Army veteran, documentary filmmaker, public speaker, and co-founder and executive director of History Unerased, an education nonprofit preparing K-12 educators to teach all students LGBT inclusive history. And I want to tell you a little secret um, about Deb. Uh, she gets really nervous in front of audiences that are not students. So for the purposes of today's show, we're going to pretend that all of you are students. Agreed? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So um, this is going to be a very short version of a Making Gay History episode uh, because I only have time for your questions. And I'm going to ask Deb questions. I will interview, I'm oh, sorry, I will interrupt Deb undoubtedly. Um, and I apologize in advance for doing that. So let's start with a uh, simple question. How did you become interested in education? Education found me. I never sought out to become an educator. My original path was criminology, studying criminology. I thought I wanted to be a police officer. Um, but I was um, in college and uh, dropped out. This was in, I entered college in 1983. And at that time in 1983, I learned for the first time a word connected to a core piece of me, and that was homosexual. And, um, for the next couple of years in college, uh, it was a bit of a difficult time. Um, and I ended up dropping out um, of college and um, working in Ocean City, Maryland for the summer and meeting my first uh, relationship. And that was the beginning of the path toward education. So I'm gonna cut ahead and then we're gonna cut back. Right. So um, let's, let's jump ahead uh, um, to being discharged from the military mm -hmm. and um, and the decision to get involved in, in education. And we'll come back to a couple of these things. Right. So, um, so you're discharged from the military um, and you have been studying Korean. Yes, I was a 98 Gulf Korean linguist and um, at what I like to call the Club Met of the Army. It was Presidio, San Francisco. Um, at the Defense Language Institute, and just about to uh, complete that uh, program, which was an intensive, almost a year long, and had orders to go to the DMZ, the border between North and South Korea, which required a top secret security clearance. Um, and they do investigate very thoroughly. Um, and I was called into the company commander's office, uh, pulled out of class, called into the company commander's office, and given a report and said, I want you to tell me if this is true. And there were three enumerated items on that list. One was that uh, I dealt cocaine. Now at that point in my life, I couldn't have told, I didn't know if it was pink or blue, if you drank it or you smoked it. <laughs> Second, that I was an alcoholic, which was the furthest thing from the truth. And third, that I was a homosexual. And I said to my company commander, um, none of this is true. And he said, well, if it was just the drugs and alcohol, we could let you stay in. I said, none of this is true. So I don't remember the time frame exactly. I go, I go back to class, maybe two days later, three days later, I pull out of class again. And I'm taken to one of these grand, glorious buildings on the Presidio. And I step into a large room, uh, maybe twice the size of this room. And very sparsely furnished, there's a table with a lie detector test, a chair next to that, um, a small couch, a little coffee table, and another chair. And a man in what we called civvies greeted me. Um, and I proceeded to, of course, fail the lie detector test. And I did the only thing I could possibly think of in that moment, and I said, it was only once. Was that true? Oh, no. <laughs> um, so, and also the, this, this man in civvies who's interrogating me, he kept going behind a door and said he was consulting with an analyst whom I never saw. 
Um, so after I, I said to uh, this individual that it was only once, he proceeded to tell me that, okay, we need a writing sample. We need to know what happened so that our analyst can discern whether or not that was indeed one experience or if you are a homosexual. So I wrote about a paragraph, handed it to him, he went behind the door, he came back, he said, no, we need more detail. A little bit more, handed to him, he went behind the door to consult with the analyst, came back, and he said, no, we need to know, and I'm sorry to deliver this information, it's uncomfortable, it will make you uncomfortable. He said to me, we need to know where her hand was, where your mouth was, so that we can analyze your experience in depth. So I did not want to give one more piece of myself. And I wrote three pages bullshit. And I handed it to him. He went behind the door. He came back and he said, and he looked me directly in the eye, leaned in and said, it's a shame men don't turn you on the same way women do. Yes, so. What um, did you think of that moment? Ah. Uh, I don't know. I, I felt pure rage. Pure rage. Um, I, it felt so absurd. But I didn't understand the degree of that absurdity. Now, when you enlist in the military, you, there was a question in 1986. Are you a homosexual? And I checked, no. It was a lie, but I didn't know it was fraud. So I was um, called into company commander's office several days later, and I was informed that I would be dishonorably discharged under fraudulent entry. Uh, again, I knew a lie, um, innocent lie, would not translate into a criminal offense. But I was also told that um, I would be allowed to graduate with the class because they had already determined, and I'm not saying to say, ooh, Rob uh, did such a great job, but I would be receiving two out of the three awards that they gave a graduating class. Just continue. I have to plug in this thing, which is running out of power. So keep going. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. So I, I graduated, and then subsequently um, was dishonorably discharged from the military. But I had the, this grand opportunity to learn the Korean language, and after being discharged, I continued to uh, I continued my college education, although I changed my major five times. And it was in a, a Japanese class in 2001 that I met some Korean students, and we began exchanging Korean foreign English lessons. And they kept saying to me, you should go to Korea and teach. And I had no idea how to teach. He said, well, you're actually doing it right now. Um, and it, along with the fact that I, I wanted to use what the, the tools the Army had given me. You know, once you, you told me that you didn't want to waste the investment, Yes. Were you thinking about their investment, your investment, or both? Both, mm -hmm. both. But but that pervasive sense of shame. That I know this this sounds a bit crazy, but for the longest time, I felt as if just navigating through everyday life meant that I was getting away with something. That I I was a fraud. That that moniker of fraud followed. Let's go back a little, a little bit back in time. Mm -hmm. um, why did you join the military in the first place? When I dropped out of college um, and began a relationship with a woman in Lewis, Delaware, um, I, I quickly ended up being uh, homeless. Lewis, Delaware, it's a beautiful town. If you're going to be homeless, it's a comfortable place. In the summer. Yes, summer approaching fall. Yes, but not comfortable after that. It's the no, when it got to be October. <laughs> um, but I heard that if you went to a recruiting station, which was close to the uh, downtown Lewis, Delaware, that you would be provided with dinner, a hotel room, and breakfast the next day. Now, I had been in ROTC in college, so it wasn't a far stretch to think that this is something that I might do. Um, and so I went. Showered, slept in bed, ate breakfast, and then the next morning I uh, pretended that I didn't have my identification, so I would have to go back the next day. 
went back and enlisted in the United States Army. So this was a, it wasn't a casual enlistment. Um, it was with purpose. And then you were thrown out yes. um, with purpose. Yes. But you found new purpose. I did. In, you know, your, in your work. I, I have a tattoo on my right shoulder that's a lotus blossom. And on the different leaves on the petals are the four corners of the Korean flag, which symbolize um, harmony and synchronicity in the universe, physical and spiritual world. And I chose the lotus flower because from the deepest mud, the most beautiful, vibrant blossoms erupt. And this situation with the United States military, it was terrible. But it led me to the path of where I am today, sitting here next to you. So how did you get from um, South Korea in 2001 to Lowell, Massachusetts, which is not a place you'd ever spent time before? No, but my parents um, had been living in Pittsburgh, and they retired to Candy and New Hampshire, and I wanted to be close to them. So when I relocated, I wanted to be um, in the New England area, as close as possible. And random twist of fate landed in Lowell, Massachusetts. And, and did you seek out a teaching job when you got, got to Lowell? I did, and my first experience was teaching at a community college. I taught English um, at Middlesex Community. And um, one of my friends there suggested that I be, every, nearly everyone is adjunct um, in the college university level. And I, I needed to make some more money. And so I never, ever imagined that I would become a high school teacher. I hated high school. I was a disaster. I skipped school more often than uh, was there. I had no idea. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so. I had an interview and was immediately whisked into Lowell High School, which is a very, I hate to use the word diverse because I think that's often misused um, or misunderstood, but Lowell High School is the most diverse um, context in Massachusetts. There are 64 different countries represented, um, countless lives. Any given day, the world arrived in my classroom from every corner of the nation including countries that criminalize homosexuality. But in your job, were you concerned about anyone finding out you were gay? Or was that not a problem when you got your job at Lowell? I was concerned. I was. And because? Well, I was more concerned about my students. I, I was concerned that be, because some of them came from native countries that criminalize homosexuality, that if they knew that I was gay, that that would somehow compromise our purpose together, that somehow it would interfere with the, our intentionality together. And what's ironic is I had all of these hanging from the lights, all of these power words, wisdom, compassion, kindness. In the middle was the word truth. And I was still being fraudulent with my students. So what, um, and I'm jumping quickly through this because I want to leave a few minutes for people to ask questions. How did you uh, then get from being a teacher, closeted, um, to founding, to leaving teaching ultimately, and founding History and Erased, which is a nonprofit that is dedicated to developing LGBT inclusive, LGBTQ inclusive uh, curriculum? What was it that changed things for you? Oh, God, I'll try to wrap that up quickly. Um, the, these new immigrants and refugees that I spoke of, um, this is a preface to answering that. Their stories were so important, and they were coming to me in so many different ways. I wanted to do something with them. And so I worked on a documentary film, Hard Truth, Levity, and Hope, with the premise of educating the school, the community at large, about what a gift these young people are to the community. So the person that I worked on that film with came back uh, about a year later, and he said, I, I want to make another film. Uh, I'm tired of continued discrimination against my gay friends and family members, and I want to do something about it. And he didn't know that I was gay. That was a mind, divine little moment of irony there. But he said to me, I, so I, I said, Connor, um, this young documentarian, do you know that I'm gay? He did not. Um, and then he asked. Because no one would guess. No one, well. Yes. 
I might add, just as an aside, mm -hmm. uh, Deb works with Miriam. Uh, what is Miriam? Morgan Stern. Miriam Morgan Stern. And when we go to meetings afterwards, people will say to me, Miriam's the gay one, Deb is the straight one, because they knew that they were a mixed, a mixed pair. And I would say, no, your, you know, your assumptions are you're flippant, because Miriam is, is, uh, is quite um, is plain looking. Mm -hmm. And she's not here, so I can say that, but we're, we're going to delete that. <laughs> <laughs> and you are not. Oh. And so people assume that, that Miriam is, is, is gay and you're straight. Um, anyway, so he, he assumed you were straight. Right. So yeah. then he, he asked, um, how are we going to find people? I said, I'm well networked. And the way that this evolved was that we interviewed seven low high school teachers, students, community members, parents. The documentary film became part of the curriculum in the middle schools and high school and uh, got a lot of attention. And I understood through the, the course of listening hours and hours and hours and hours to the messages coming from these young people and educators that we need to do more to bring LGBT voices into the curriculum. And so that became the goal of History and Race. Yes. Correct. Okay, so we wound up working, oh, can you give me a couple of examples um, of history that you wanted to bring into the classroom and how you've done it. This would normally be a three hour conversation, so we're doing this in much less, sorry. Uh, I think when I learned about the Lavender Scare and Frank Kameny, and... How many of you have heard of Frank Kameny? Yeah, so during, um, domestic anti-communism efforts during the 1950s, what also occurred at the same time, now that's been dubbed the Red Scare, but the part of the era Red Scare, was the Lavender Scare. Um, and it was a systematic witch hunt to purge the federal government of homosexuals. You know, the Red Scare lasted a relatively short amount of time. The Lavender Scare lasted decades. And when I learned that my story was a piece of that, That was very profound, and I think, and I, I do want to share, speaking of the Lavender Scare, yeah. we all know that despite undeniable advancements for LGBT equality, the statistics relating to LGBTQ youth and homelessness, suicidality, risk behaviors, dropout rates are worsening. And this work is incredibly important in order to mitigate those statistics, but this is imp important for everyone, for all young people, for everyone, to learn a more accurate and inclusive history that includes people who we label and understand today as LGBTQ. All right, so kids study, they'll study the Red Scare, they'll study the Civil Rights Movement in Bayard Rustin. They generally don't know Bayard Rustin was gay, and that figured prominently into his role in the Civil Rights Movement. They know about the Red Scare, they don't know about the Lavender Scare and all the lives that were changed by that. Mm -hmm. um, and so all you're doing is really unerasing this piece of it's always been there. It's always been there. Yeah. It's always been there. And, and everything we're doing is grounded in primary and secondary sources from the Library of Congress, from Eric's archive, um, from esteemed institutions, which is a grand imprimatur about the substantiating the relevancy and value of this. So we teamed up. We did. Um, and Deb and Miriam developed curriculum materials that are anchored by short versions of the Making Gay History podcast. Sarah Birmingham, executive producer of Making Gay History. Um, uh, created seven-minute versions of these, some of these episodes, several of the episodes. They're called, we call them Pottinis or Podettes. <laughs> um, and uh, so there are two basic, the project we worked on with the New York City Department of Education was creating uh, an eighth grade and eleventh grade curriculum, uh, student and teacher guides for both. And we cut four pieces for one of those guides and uh, two pieces for another. And then a sh very short introduction to introduce students and teachers to what that is. And Sarah is going to play that for us. And just make sure you're on this because it had turned itself off. Oh, well, it looks like that. That's changed. Hi, I'm Eric Marcus from Making Gay History. And this is the Give Voice to History Project. In the late 1980s, I recorded a hundred interviews for a book I was writing about the LGBTQ civil rights movement, which we called the gay rights movement back then. After I finished the book, the cassette tapes sat in storage for almost 30 years. But then I dug them out, the New York Public Library digitized them, and I took a listen. 
Suddenly, I was back with all these people again, at their dining room tables, in their living rooms, sitting across from them and hearing about their lives. Now, I get to share these amazing stories with you, individual stories that connect to the bigger story of American civil rights. Here, I'm out there being a revolutionist for everybody else, so now it's time to do my thing for my own people. Kept giving us the, you know, the back of the bus type of thing, you know, where you can sit over there and you can sit over here and you'll have free drinks, but you will not, you cannot sit here, you will not be served here. And if there's anything the king had taught us, it was that we could sit anywhere in the restaurant we wanted to sit. For me on the show to be able to say, I'm gay, was like, I mean, I cried every, we, you know, take we did, every time we did that, even in rehearsal I cried when I did it, um, because it was such a release for me. What, maybe a thousand people sitting in the audience, and, and the mayor was up at the podium talking, it was just me. What was I going to do? I did what anyone else would do, I walked onto the stage and I took the podium away from John Lindsay. Things are going to have to change drastically in this country. For pe people are going to have to wake up and realize, wait a minute, I am an average American citizen. Whether I'm gay or lesbian or anything else, given that simple fact alone, there's no way in hell I should have gone through what I went through in the military. Three decades ago, when I started researching and interviewing for my book, I was outraged that I'd never heard these stories before. Stories of accidental activists, committed revolutionaries, and happy civil rights warriors who gave me a greater understanding of who I am and where I'm from. My hope is that by sharing these stories with you now, in a way that wasn't possible when I was a student, you'll have a deeper understanding of how individuals, people like you and me, can challenge laws, institutions, and assumptions, and come together to make big changes. So let's get started. There's something fundamentally wrong about choking up over one's recording. <laughs> but I think about being that student in the classroom um, all those years ago, and what a difference it would have made to hear, hear something like this, which is really um, extraordinary. And I so value our partnership in doing this. Oh, no, I'm getting a little no. <laughs> um, So we have a few minutes for your questions. We started a little late. We were 15 minutes late, then we were five minutes more late. So we'll go to 10 to 11. Um, happy to take your questions about what we do. Yes? First, I don't think it's wrong to chuck up over your recordings because whenever I listen to your podcast, honestly, I cry all the time. <laughs> Even if it's if, if it's like a happy episode, I'm crying. I'm going to start crying right now. I'm sorry. But... <laughs> But um, I wanted to ask you, um, first of all, thank you for the amazing work that you're doing. Um, I never learned about like LGBT history. I'm honestly learning it from you, listening to your podcast. And like I only started learning about LGBT, LGBT history when I started my own coming out process. But I was also wondering, are you focusing only on like American history or are you going to think about branching out into like other areas? Because I'm Cuban American uh -huh. and after the revolution, the uh, Castro regime actually started mass executing LG LGBT people and <laughs> it's really not something that's talked about and a lot of people who don't know about it really will like go on to excuse it because Mariella Castro marches in the pride parade. Uh, yes, well maybe we can exchange contact information, but what you're, it, right now, we're a relatively new organization and, and we're um, concentrating on primarily World War II to present, but we will be expanding that if you want to Thank you. And with Making Gay History, we're, we've been focused also on the U.S., but the uh, episode we posted last week on Magnus Hirschfeld yeah, listen um, to that. It was a great episode. Thank, thank you. you. Sarah worked for months on that episode. Um, that took us to Germany um, and, and made, made us realize, made me realize that we owe a great debt to Magnus Hirschfeld and what he started in 1897, since we can trace our movement back all the way back there. But we haven't, we've talked about doing it internationally. Yeah. But also, it's very you're interesting talking about the um, Cuban experience. One of the earliest protests here 
was actually members of the Mattachine Society. Um, in fact, it was um, Dick Leitch, Randy Wicker, and others who were outside the United Nations protesting against exactly that. And there are some amazing photographs of uh, I didn't them. know that. Yes. Um, if we exchange details, I can connect you with that. Some of it, Dick is um, going to be in later this season. Um, and while well, I haven't finished editing that episode yet, that may be one of the things that features, because that was an early protest. Um, they got together, but that was pre sip that was, um, that they did outside the United Nations. I didn't know that. Thank about you. Exactly That's that. really important. Yeah. That was 65? Yeah, and they were carrying, I'm trying to remember what the poster said, but it was basically, um, uh, today labor camps, tomorrow the gas chamber, question mark. Um, and was, uh, you know, I think is uh, extraordinary in that it was in, um, uh, still early-ish in the movement here. They're showing solidarity uh, with other LGBT people in a way that now we see many activists having a renewed awareness here in the space about sort of, um, to uh, quote our friends at LGBT underscore history um, and Adam uh, from, uh, Voice of, uh, from Voices for Chechnya, um, you know, supporting the queer family and um, mess with one, yeah. mess with soul. Yeah. So I'll just take one more question. Yeah, I, I wonder how you deal with um, sort of the, I don't know how to phrase it, but the self censorship of primary and secondary sources. In my undergraduate research, I looked at um, mid century. American composers um, who would write to each other in really coded language, and yeah. it was almost a, and, and one composer in particular, I mean, Leonard Bernstein, his family up until very recently would sort of deny that daddy was gay, and so he can't read these letters. And so I wonder how you deal with, especially with, with folks that are not unable to interview now, how you deal with trying to tell these stories of people who had complicated um, sexualities and, and how, and in their own personal experiences, writing to their friends even, like, were unable to really express who they were as people. That's a wonderful question, and thank you for that question. That's critically important. Um, it, you know, we, we cannot assign today's language to the past. That would be a historical and irresponsible. We cannot dig into the study of history through what we call a perverse presentism and thinking about how we understand identity today. So what, what is infinitely important is to, to make sure that all of the materials express that and that the language used when interacting with these educated resources mirrors the language in the primary and secondary source materials. We do not, this is critically important, we're not outing people in history. It's not about that. It's broadening the context. And f for example, um, a unit on the Civil War and female bodied people who passed as soldiers and fought and not assigning judgment and or labeling that as a trans identity, but saying, but giving students the opportunity to explore possible motivations of why. Was it economic? Was it a relationship? Did it, was it more comfortable representation? Was it patriotism? Um, so the, the primary and secondary source analysis is really important. And the guiding questions are important too, open-ended questions. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. And just a quick aside about uh, Leonard Bernstein before we Great. Um, I had tried to interview him back in the late 80s. I, a friend of mine worked for him, and he said no. And then uh, very close to, uh, she came back to me quite a, a while later and said, he's thinking of being interviewed. Um, I'll, I'll get back to you in the next few days. And he died two weeks later. Oh, no. So that was when people ask, who's the interview who got away? Leonard Bernstein, um, because he was thinking he would come out in, in the book. Um, I didn't. Yeah. yeah. So thank you, Deb, uh, thank for you, your work. Eric. And thank you all for being here. And sorry we had to rush. Thank you so much.